thanks again for having me this morning. Um, I, I've been living in Cyprus for the past seven months. I came here to join my partner earlier this year. And it's been a wonderful experience, not just to enjoy the sunshine, but also to meet people like uh, uh, Sylvia and Victoria and uh, Tatiana Sinonidou, who does lots of copyright work. Um, I'm an intellectual property lawyer and uh, in a way very much a practitioner of open data. Uh, my last uh, appointment before I came to Cyprus uh, was the management of the National Patent Analytics Hub, which was a unit set up by the Australian Patent Office to work with research organizations and policymakers to help them harness the value of information included in global databases, global intellectual property databases. And this is just one example of how you can visualize patent data. Uh, it enables you to monitor uh, international developments in science and technology. It enables you to identify the areas of competitive advantage. It enables you to reposition your IP strategies. It enables you to develop intellectual property strategies. So my approach to research data management is very much based on this commercial, commercialization business, you know? We have a piece of intellectual property which we have protected, which we're trying to commercialize. That's what I was trained to do, but then seven years ago, I met my PhD supervisor, Professor Brian Fitzgerald, who's the head of the Creative Commons in Australia, and he really changed my approaches to this. All of a sudden, I realized that it's not all about commercialization, and in fact, the reasons for protecting university research uh, are there, and this should be done, but 99% of cases, you're talking about open science, about research which should be publicly available, research which can help others to, uh, to do faster and better. Um, so, you know, I, I changed my approaches from being really commercial and, and making money out of IP towards opening up and actually increasing the benefits of science because ultimately all of this is about increasing the impact of science. If we can disseminate science sooner, faster, to broader audiences, the potential to innovate with the outcomes, the potential to build upon it is much greater. Um, so this is, this is where I'm coming from. And as you know, data, computers, are collab and collaboration are extending the frontiers of science. And over the past six years in particular, I've been working a lot uh, with the European Organization for Nuclear Research. And, you know, that's really one of those organizations which have embraced open data, which have embraced um, collaboration as a way to advance science. You know, if you look at a certain paper, you would see 20 pages of authors at the very end. There's two teams, uh, CMS team and the Atlas team, and they in fact compete with one another. Each has about 3,000 researchers, all of them built uh, of work with data collected as part of the Large Hadron Collider experiments. Uh, that's what you can see on the picture. So why do we need open scientific data? Well, look, the first reason is, look, we can't really go without it. Um, and you can read the, uh, a statement by the former CERN director who actually said, look, we just need to move on with times. Uh, you know, the scale of the experiments, the availability of data, the, the volume of the data collected, it just does not allow us to do the research the way we used to do it. And to me, CERN is really a front runner in this area because I have seen the organization grown into it. You know, if, if someone tells you you have to do research data management, I think you have to be realistic and, and actually know that organizations do research data management when they grow themselves into it. It's a process, continuous process of innovation. It's not something we can impose on them through introducing policies, you, can, you cannot force it. It has to come from within. It has to be driven by researchers. It has to come from them. But what has really helped is that the policies, the mandates of research funders in particular, which mandate research data management plans, and I know that Martin Donnelly spoke about that yesterday, uh, those policies were the trigger 
you know, all of a sudden researchers from CERN came to the library and said, we want to compete for grants, please help us to do research data management. What is this research data management plan we have to submit? So in a way, we do research data management because we have to, but it is something that has to be uh, ingrained in the organization itself. It's not something that can be imposed. So when I talk about research data management, I, I really mean the process of organizing, manipulating, storing, curating, and above all, using research data to enhance, uh, enhance its preservation and access into the future. I think the use is very important because I'll, I'll mention later that the value of open scientific data is their potential for future use and reuse. It is not just publishing data for the sake of publishing more data. There's so much data out there and, and you know lots about information overload. What we need is good quality data and if there's one thing you just remember from my presentation today, it's exactly that. We don't need more open scientific data we need quality data. It doesn't have to be big data. It can be good little data, but data which is well documented, well supported. Uh, the vision is, of course, to make the data available and useful for unknown audiences and for un unanticipated purposes. And there you have to ask yourself whether, for a start, this is feasible and realistic and achievable and secondly, how we can best do it. And, and that's what organizations like CERN have been pondering over the past few years. And they are doing it, but they are still learning. Uh, as I said before, this is a continuous learning process. And another point to make is that open scientific data and open access publications are two completely different animals, even though we tend to approach them with the same mindset. And again, this is wrong. For open data, we need to have an open mindset. We're starting uh, from, from nowhere, but we cannot apply the approaches which worked for open access to publications. Those approaches are not appropriate for open access to data for several reasons. If you have a research publication that you want to publish open access, all you need to do is to put the, the peer-reviewed copy uh, accepted for publication on the internet, whether it's green root or whether it's gold root, doesn't matter, but you have the publication available. All you need to do is put it up on the internet and the library can help you. With data, it's not quite as simple. You know, you have a large research project, 50 people working on the project, all people manipulating the data, all people working with it, and all of a sudden you want to make the data set uh, legible and uh, available for others to reuse. Um, such data requires curation and substantial inputs from researchers. Uh, do we expect researchers to spend as much time uh, working on, on data curation as we expect them on working on research? I think it's, it's no way that researchers can be data managers. Um, the emerging profession of data scientists can help and librarians can help. But again, you know, librarians are not scientists. They cannot interpret scientific data. Data scientists are not librarians. They may not know how the data should be curated. And again, researchers, they're interested in science. Why would you burden researchers, uh, you know, doing data curation? So I guess these are the balancing things we need to contemplate and we need to work with them. And it's only experience that will teach us how to do it better. Uh, what we're seeing now is the beginning, and the policies have been a great impetus for uh, getting more open data out there, but now we need to work on quality. Uh, and again, you know, with publications, researchers are incentivized to publish and increase the impact. So in a way, it's in their interest to, to publish open access. Uh, with data, we know that if you publish data alongside your publications, that the citations rate improve. But ultimately, there are no, no incentives for researchers to do that. Um, so again, you know, uh, this is a barrier that we need to address. Um, in the curation of open data, um, open access publications, librarians were the key and really were uh, the driving force behind it. Um, with open data, this impetus needs to come from the managers of research organizations and researchers themselves. 
Um, and there are certain fears, and you know, the title of my presentation is From free Fear to Freedom. It can be done, and we need to talk about it, but in a way, this process is part of the unraveling, is part of the learning process, and something that enables innovation. So the key difference is that for publications, one size generally fits all. With data, it's always contextual. Every data set is different. It varies not only across scientific disciplines, but also across different projects, across different people. So if you talk to two biologists, they will too have different approaches to that. Um, and I'll touch on that later. So I talk about the promise of it. Um, it requires collaboration and trust. You know, we all use money as a currency and we all have trust in money that we use every day to exchange goods, to work, to be motivated. The same with data. Data is only as good as the people behind it. Um, if, if I'm reusing somebody else's data, I have to be able to rely on the data. And I only rely on the data if I have trust in the people. You know, if you want to be devil's advocate, you can always say this data is no good. If you want to sit on somebody's back, you can say this is no good. I think we have to change our approach. We have to be positive and try to work with it rather than saying it's no good. And um, that's where the change of psyche comes through. We all want to do research data management. Uh, some organizations are better at it than others, but ultimately, you know, we are human beings and we are scared of change. Uh, individuals, work team, leadership groups, and even whole organizations are naturally averse to change as they unknowingly protect themselves from making the very changes they most desire. This is not me saying this. This is Robert Kagan and Lisa Laskov, who have many, many years of experience in change management. And they've done multiple experiments with organizations, how they adapt to change and what actually uh, drives them. And what they found, you know, we all want to do research data management, but in a way, we need to overcome the psychological barriers. And what can be done? Well, having conferences like this is a good starting point, you know, to share experiences, to engage researchers. And I think what needs to happen is, is, is to really drive the engagement of researchers, and you as librarians can do a lot to make that happen. So, what are the key issues that came up in research data management over the past three years that's really, you know, where the experience goes to? Well, if you say research data management, look, I'm a lawyer, I ask you, well, what the hell do you mean by data? And I asked this question uh, to CERN a few years ago, two years ago. Well, we're sharing data, so how do you define data? Well, look, you know, that we have multiple sources of data and it always depends on the project. But really, a data is everything. It means different things to every, different people, from big data to little data, as I mentioned, from data you collect uh, you know, at the source through Large Hadron Collider experiments, you know, through data collected from surveys, to process data, which is the data where, which, you know, where you standardize names, where you use software to work with it, where you cleaned. Uh, the data set where you, you know, standardized it statistically. So I think we need to bring more clarity into this. And again, it's going to vary across discipline, vary across project to project, but it's important um, because at the moment, researchers really don't know what data they need to provide to publishers and, and research funders as part of the policies they introduced. So open data is free for anyone to use, reuse, and redistribute, but what is the substance of it? That's where we're struggling. But there seems to be an emergent agreement that research data are the evidence used to support the findings and arguments in science, research, and scholarship. The evidence is important because what is science? Science is the amount of knowledge we have about something, let's say, cure of um, cancer of particular type, uh, at, at the time, as of today. Tomorrow there is a new research which comes up with different findings and can support those findings with evidence. So the new evidence rebuts the old evidence and what becomes scientific knowledge of the time is the best available and best possible evidence. So data really is the evidence that supports the claims you make in your publications. 
that's important. So what is it, what is it in practice? What's the evidence? It's data captured from instruments, it's data collected, collected in surveys, it's derived data, documents, spreadsheets and databases. Uh, there is a bit of a discussion whether the laboratory notebooks should be treated as data. In the US, they say we should not do that, and there are reasons for that. Uh, being a patent lawyer, you know, when you're filing patent applications, uh, the US used to have a system whereby it was the evidence uh, that you invented the actual invention, you know, claimed in the, in the application. They changed the system, now it is who, whoever files first the application, so they have aligned with the rest of the world. But potentially, lab notebooks have a great commercial value, so that's why they were excluded in the US uh, from, from the data, which is, um, which should be available, defined as open data. It could be visualization, models, software, images, whatever you know. And again, it varies among scientists. You know, hardcore scientists, engineering, biotech is different to social scientists and arts and humanities. So, you know, there's lots of learning for us on this way, and I don't know at this point how to cope with it. We cannot have a librarian who curates data for every different science, or maybe we have. Bigger universities can afford it, and it would be good to hear from you uh, what you're already doing. Uh, but the key point I'd like to make is the data is always contextual. You know, you, you really have to work with the project, look at uh, what the project is, what the researcher saying the data is, and you have to look at the arguments, including in the publication, and make sure that all the data that's in your data set actually backs up the claims you make. But in my PhD, I have suggested that rather than working with this fuzzy concept of data uh, and get uh, really accustomed to the complexity, we need to come up with a minimum standard for open scientific data. And that includes the scientific data, which, which I already mentioned, you know, notebooks, spreadsheets, uh, pictures, object data collected by instruments, metadata, which is very, very important, and I'll talk about it shortly, and, and software. Software is a question mark, because if you work uh, with Excel, it's a property of Microsoft. So, can you, Excel probably everyone has, but let's talk about specific scientific software which is proprietary. Of course you cannot share it. So what can you do? At the very least, you should list the version that you used so that when other people want to use your data to rerun the experiment, they actually know which version you used and it may not be available. So again, you know, I'm asking the question, is reproducibility of science feasible? And yes, it is amongst researchers and they're already doing it. What is changing, though, is that we want people outside the research community to be able to do it as well. Or researchers, which are not biologists, uh, you know, work uh, with, with them or, you know, um, meshing up research disciplines. And that, that's been a trend over the past few years, um, you know, but across fertilization of scientific disciplines. But again, if you talk to a physicist, you know, they are quite reluctant uh, about having the data scrutinized by somebody else. So we need to develop better protocols for that. And, and one of the protocols that needs to improve is the metadata, the description of what the data set actually is, how you collected the data, you know, what methodologies you used. Um, am I going up or down? So, you know, when you talk to people, what is metadata? Well, it's information about data. This is not sufficient, and you as librarians have to push them to actually give you, uh, explain to you, describe precisely what the data is, how they collected it, how they cleaned it, what software they used, what statistical methods they used to standardize the data, how exactly they did it, and look, if you write this information after the project is complete, it's never going to be accurate and complete. You have to do these protocols as you do research. Because, you know, like I cleaned the data today and I know how much work is required in this and if you don't document it, it's never going to be properly done. We don't have protocols for that and there's a few pilots um, underway which actually uh, where researchers are trying to develop these protocols, but until we have better metadata, open scientific data is not very useful because other people cannot uh, you know, reliably reuse it. So this is very important to work on the metadata, and that's where I feel our efforts should concentrate right now. 
to help researchers grasp the concept of metadata and how, how to make the data set legible and reusable to someone who's not a scientist. And you can test it with researchers at the university. You know, you ask them, well, can you reuse the data? How, what, what did you come up with? Uh, so th this is just a thought. Um, making data sensible and usable, this is where this needs to go. No, ne no necessity to have more data set and illegible data. It needs to be sensible and usable and discoverable. And again, metadata enable discoverability. So this is really the bread and butter of open scientific data. Um, Another point uh, to make is whether we should be pushing for open by default or controlled access. And my view on this is, and again it's a personal view, that open by default should be the aim. But at the same time we have to be realistic that it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's a process and as I said, organizations have to grow themselves into research data management, into the curation and reuse of data in particular. Uh, and at the moment, they're experimenting with it. We, uh, we're learning. So what should be the default now, and I think it should be, is the data underpinning scientific publications. If you publish in Nature or Science or any other scientific journal, and you make claims about advancing science, you should be able to support those claims with evidence. And the evidence, as we said, is the data. Geospatial data and uh, earth sciences, you know, should be free to facilitate access to public infrastructure, uh, manage public health issues, and importantly, to stimulate economic activities. You know, when we had open uh, human genome projects, which start, it was complete in 2003, you know, people were shaking their heads. In a way, we overturned the patent system because we made the human genome public, which means that all patents which are associated with it were all of a sudden held invalid. People stopped patenting in that area, so we shifted the boundaries. What used to be private all of a sudden became public. And now this is a multi-billion dollar industry. You know, open data has really generated subsequent business. The same geospatial data, you know, GPS. Uh, we really are grateful for this to America and, and to Korea because it was an American plane which flew over Korea and, you know, there were issues of... Uh, going into the national space, and that's how we got GPS. You know, that's a gift to humanity. It's open, and look, look at the business it has generated. So this is what can be done with data. Uh, there are business opportunities for it, but we need to explore them. And again, it requires time. And I already mentioned the Human Genome Project and genomic data, which is increasingly being made available, and that's the norm. Uh, in fact, if you remember the E. coli epidemic in Germany in 2012, it was the Chinese researchers who helped uh, the German Koch Institute to crack the code, and it was published openly on the internet, and there were teams working on it, but they used open scientific data as a basis for developing the vaccine. It was very successful, and it all happened within four days. So, but the reality is that at this point, most data is controlled. And um, the, the reasons why it is controlled are that um, complex interpretations, assumptions, and detailed analysis are required or involved, and uh, that the data cannot be shared because of privacy concerns, and um, particu particularly referring to clinical trials data. This is the most valuable data we have. It's ready, uh, it's properly curated, ready to be shared, but we are not sharing it because we say that patients do not want to have their data shared. Well, this is one view. If you actually ask the patients, uh, most of them are happy to share, but the, the, the issue where we failed in previous years that we were not aware of the privacy concerns and data collected in 2002 does not have uh, privacy consent, uh, the consent for sharing attached to it. So in a way, now it is impossible to share the data because for a start, it's difficult to contact those people again, and they don't have the consent. So this is what pharmaceutical companies are using as a justification not to share data. I think we need to work with it. And look, there's always two sides of the story. You know, you can use data to enhance science. Uh, what else would you do with it, you know? Uh, again, it's, it's guarding about of protection of commercial interests, but if people work together, they can achieve much more. If people share data, they, they work better. 
And even pharmaceutical companies are seeing this. So if I were a pharmaceutical, working in a pharmaceutical company, I would be looking for ways to engage people in, the, in using the data I already have and to try to come up with new, uh, new uh, uses of the data, like biomarkers, testing, you know, this is where science can make huge improvements. So uh, just, just to sum up on this, well, it's not happening at the moment, and in fact, nothing has changed in clinical trials and particle physics. You know, researchers have always shared data amongst themselves. They've always collaborated, they've always shared software. But what we're trying to do now is to, to, to enable the sharing via the internet. And um, there are some, some practical issues with that. Uh, while we're working on the privacy issues, while we're trying to work out whether it can be done, Organizations are still controlling access to their research data, but they still enable reuse. So this is the example from CERN. They have four levels. The first one is the content of scientific publications and data, uh, which is embedded in these publications. You know, that's open by default. Level two is simplified data formats, like the Higgs boson, which they discovered a few years ago. You know, they've got beautiful data sets, and they run master classes in Greece and Cyprus as well. And uh, this has been very successful, you know, presenting the data to higher research students and actually showing them the Higgs boson. But then it comes to level three and level four data, where you come to simulation data along with software, workflow analysis, other documentation, and, and the raw data, you know. The raw data is available for every physicist in the world. The, they can access, uh, you know, the platform where it is. Um, and CERN has the policy that if you use the data, they all use the same data collected as part of Large Hadron Collider experiments, but they use different methods to clean the data, to rerun the analysis. You know, particle physics is much about replicated data analysis. You have an idea of what a new particle might be like. You've got a, a faint idea of what the mass should be. Uh, you know what other properties it should have. And then you're kind of looking for it. It is not that you spot it like, like a phenomenon. You actually have to know what you're looking for. Uh, and that's the concern of CERN, okay? Like we give people data and we give them our publications and all of a sudden someone says that our publications are not valid. You know, these are scientific disciplines where you're really on the edge. You know, what is science, what is religion? Uh, I think this is where science operates. And um, very often, you know, the, the findings are, and conclusions are not as straightforward as they can be in clinical trials, for example. So what are some other barriers to sharing? Well, there are too many stakeholders, too many interests, very often conflicting interests. And this is, um, uh, this is just a collection of stakeholders uh, the one on the, my left-hand side, uh, we came up with the list of these people when we contemplated who should be attributed for data. Because again, I noticed, I mentioned incentives for researchers, you know? If you cannot be attributed for the data you've developed, what else is there for you? You don't get paid for it. You don't get professional career recognition for it. So what the hell is there? So we came up with a list of these people who should be attributed for data, provided they are involved in data collection, analysis, curation. But again, like, you know, you've got too many stakeholders. And of course, research funders um, may have different interests to uh, research organizations and publishers and data custodians. So um, again, what would help uh, to drive open scientific data is to articulate the interests of these stakeholders more clearly and try to find a common ground rather than saying, uh, you know, we cannot work together or this is conflicting. So what are some of the fears of researchers? And these really are fears. Look, they have no time to curate data. They're busy with research. You know, if you want to do something with researchers, uh, they paid for publications, they paid for research projects, they paid for competitive grants they get. Uh, data is not included. And until we change their performance indicators, I feel uh, there won't be much change and not much uh, of an incentive for them to engage in data sharing and data curation. Uh, I already mentioned uh, the concerns about validity of secondary data analysis and interpretation of results. Um, the lack of incentive, curate, and share data, of course, you know, like open scientific data, the prerequisite for it is that researchers are willing to share, and are they? 
Um, they are to a certain uh, extent, but they also compete with one another, and this is just not going to go, and again, we need to be realistic about that. And the last one I think is very important is the, the lack of incentives to reuse somebody else's data. At this stage, the data may not be readily available, discoverable, but we need to have a few success stories. We need a few champions which actually tell us this is how we used open data and this is what the difference it made to humanity. We've seen some of that with the Human Genome Project and how wonderful it can be. And to me, this is the best example we have, but we need more so examples. Uh, we need examples coming from little data collected by the University of Cyprus, which is going to be reused by the University of uh, you know, Harvard or Stanford or whatever. Uh, we need this cross-fertilization to happen. And I don't think we have any recipes at this point how, how it can be done. What are some of the fears of policymakers and research funders? Well, the issue is the cost. You know, open scientific data won't happen by default. It needs to be facilitated. It requires large investments in data infrastructures, resources, human resources in particular, knowledge infrastructures. We all need to learn how to do it, and we need to work with it. And we need people to help us to curate data. We need people and infrastructure to decide how long we're going to preserve the data for, what we're actually preserving. And this is very important with software. You know, like, do you require libraries to keep the latest version of any software? Or do we really just get the, the, the version which was used to do the, the preliminary analysis published and just leave it at that? Uh, you know, these are some of the practical concerns that need to be addressed, and researchers need more guidance from policymakers and from libraries in that regard. So the issue is cost, you know, the money needs to be spent now, and we're talking about the benefit which will be harnessed in the future. And how can we balance these two? To me, this is the key we need to ask ourselves. You know, there's no point in having more data for the sake of having data nobody's going to use. And what I want to suggest to you today, that the value of open scientific data is in the potential for future reuse and in the quality. Because if data is good, it can be reused in the future by anyone. If you're just publishing you know, spreadsheets, we do not make sense and we don't know how you collected the data, don't bother, you know. Put your resources into something which is going to make a difference. And how we make the choices about what data to, to curate and preserve, this is where we need to have a good conversation. And it's not a conversation which happens at the level of librarians. We need to engage researchers. Uh, we need to engage policymakers. We need to let them, the, 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 the change management policies, which, which change their organizations for being closed towards being open. Look at CERN, you know, 50 years ago when you talked about nuclear physics, like look at the Manhattan Project, you know, uh, Second World War, 1939, you know, Albert Einstein was not allowed to work on that project, even he initia initiated it because he didn't get a security clearance. 60 years later, we have all data collected at the largest nuclear organization in the world being available for anyone to look at, reuse, work on. You know, these are profound changes, and I don't think we really appreciate the scope of change and the magnitude of change which needs to be managed. You won't convince a researcher which is 70, who is 70 years old, uh, they need to work with someone who's young and inspires them to do it, rather than claiming uh, that it cannot be done. So, the other concern is how we safeguard the value of open data and why should we be doing it? Why should we facilitate the Chinese to use the data produced in Europe or America? And again, it comes down to collaboration. If we work all together as scientific teams, doesn't matter whether we're from China, Australia, America, Cyprus, we work together, we produce better results. And in fact, the capacity to reuse data is limited to elites. It's, it's the case, it has been the case for many years and it's going to be the case into the future. And if you look at the, uh, the distribution of uh, open data repositories, you can see that it's actually Europe leading the world with 45.3%, followed by America. So these are the people who contribute and these are the people who are going to reap the benefits. So those fears of policymakers are really unfounded. So what have we learned so far? I know I'm running a little bit over time and I'm staying in between your uh, morning tea. So 
Um, I said it a few times, I said it again and last time, the value of open scientific data lies primarily in their quality and the potential for future use and reuse. This is what we need to think about when making choices about what data to preserve and curate and, and use the resources to do that. More open scientific data does not necessarily mean more op science, open science or data-driven science. We have uh, technical capabilities to analyze large amounts of data and to connect large amounts of data as well and to do computer science, but again, uh, it's better to use data, which is good quality data. And I said it again, open data requires an open mindset. Um, and part of that open mindset is to develop strong leadership and change management skills within research organizations. Um, we need to give further guidance to researchers and librarians what research data means across scientific disciplines, across different projects. And that's perhaps where your research data management should start, or the research data management planning should start. You know, let's try to define it at the very beginning. What does research data mean to us in the context of this project? Let's not wait for the project to be complete. Let's do it at the very beginning. What are the incentives for researchers and their organizations to curate, share, and reuse data? Well, th there are some incentives, but let's be frank, not too many, and this is not going to happen unless everyone's excited about it. So can we excite researchers to do more open data, to collaborate freely on science? Can we run projects to do that? And uh, that's where policymakers could help. Resources are not infinite and we have to make choices. And as I said, the primary criterion should be the potential for reuse and um, change. And um, metadata are the key to improved quality. We have to really work on the definition of metadata, work on ways to record metadata as we do research, rather than doing it at the end of scientific projects. This needs to be something that requires more discussions amongst researchers, among different scientific disciplines, uh, with librarians, uh, with data hosts and providers. Uh, it can be done, you know, we see that geospatial data is working perfectly and there's where lessons can be learned. We can learn many lessons for clinical research. Um, and I think these are the two areas where humanities and social sciences and the arts could draw some inspiration from. Um, so thank you very much for listening and apologies for running a bit over time.